Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. I know it's been a little while since I put some content up here and I have to apologize for that. Life got a little bit crazy there for a while and then there were some burnout issues and then I just lacked motivation and I never really got back into the groove of putting videos up here. But recently a lot of exciting things have started to happen in the Go community and it really got me motivated to start sharing more videos about the Go programming language. So then I had to figure out what kind of videos do I want to produce. So I eventually landed on the idea of just starting at the very beginning of the language, working our way through, and then we'll see where this goes. So if you have something that you're particularly interested in, feel free to leave some comments down below, and I'd be happy to add that to my list of ideas of videos that I will create. So I wanted to start out with an introduction to the Go language itself. Now I know that this is much storied territory, but I have to start somewhere, and this is going to serve as a stepping off point for us to go through a survey of the entire Go language, as well as hitting some of the key libraries along the way. So the first thing that we need to know is that Go was created by a small team within Google, and that team was made up of Robert Griesemer, Rob Pike, and Ken Thompson. Now these guys have been around the software industry for a little while. For example, Ken designed and implemented the first Unix operating system, as well as had a key role in the development of Unicode. So when these guys got together and decided that they wanted to create a language, we had a lot of talent in the room as soon as these guys got together. But one of the questions that we need to understand is why create a new language at all? Well, to understand that, we have to look at the languages that are common inside of Google. And at the time that Go was being designed, there were really three languages that were key. The first is Python, then Java, and then C and C++. Now, each of these languages in and of itself is very powerful. However, the Go designers started to recognize that there were some limitations that Google was running into that might not be able to be fixed given the history and the designs of the existing languages. So for example, when we look at Python, Python is very easy to use, but it's an interpreted language, and so it can be a little bit difficult to run applications at Google scale that are based on Python. It can certainly happen, but that is one of the challenges that you can run into in very large Python implementations. Java is very quick, but its type system has become increasingly complex over time. Now this is a natural trend that a lot of languages go through. They start out very simple, but as additional use cases and additional features are layered into the language, it becomes increasingly more difficult to navigate things. C and C++ is quick as well. However, it suffers from a complex type system and additionally, its compile times are notoriously slow. Now the type system has been receiving a lot of attention lately in the C and C++ communities. However, they still have the burden of needing to manage all that legacy code. And so similar to Java, it's very difficult for them to move past the history that they have because C++ applications written 10 years ago still need to compile today. And those slow compile times are another legacy issue that C and C++ have inherited as well. When C and C++ were designed, computers had nowhere near as much memory as they do today. So the decision was made to optimize the compilers to use a minimum amount of memory, and one of the compromises that that brought about was the compile times can be a little bit sluggish. In addition, all three of these languages were created in a time where multi-threaded applications were extremely rare. Almost every application that was created really had to focus on a single thread at a time. So concurrency patterns built into these languages are patched in at best. And so working in highly parallel, highly concurrent applications like Google often runs into can be a little bit challenging when working in these three languages. So, enter Go. What does Go bring to the party in order to address some of these concerns? Well, the first thing that we need to understand is Go is a strong and statically typed language. So it inherits that same feature set from Java and C++. So what do we mean by strong and statically typed? Well, strong typing means that the type of a variable cannot change over time. So when you declare a variable A to hold an integer, it's always going to hold an integer. You can't put a Boolean in it. You can't put a string in it. And static typing means that all of those variables have to be defined at compile time. Now, are there ways around that? Yes, Go does have features that allow you to get around its type system, but 99% of the time you're going to be living in a world that's strong and statically typed and getting all the benefits that come with that. Now, if you come from languages such as Java, then you might be a little concerned that strong and statically typed languages tend to be a little bit verbose. Well, we'll see as we get into some Go syntax how there's been a lot of effort taken to make the compiler do as much work to understand what you're talking about with a variable, so you don't have to explain to the compiler every time what your variable types and things like that are. In addition, Go, like a lot of recent languages, has a strong focus on the community that's supporting it. Just because Go is an excellent language does not guarantee success. 
because there are so many languages out there that it can become difficult for a new developer to ramp up on any one. As a result, there's a strong community built up around Go that's really focused on making sure that the Go language keeps moving forward and that new developers have as easy a time as possible ramping up onto the language. So what are some of the key features of the language itself? One of the first and, I would argue, most important features that Go has is a recognition that simplicity is a feature. So as we go through and start learning about the Go language, you're going to run into some features and you're going to ask yourself, well, why doesn't this exist? Or why don't we have that feature? And a lot of the reasons come back to this feature. There's a recognition that if the Go language recognizes simplicity is important, then that means that we're going to have to decide to leave out some other features that might be very useful, but would add complexity to the language. Additionally, Go focuses on extremely fast compile times. A lot of modern development environments to write code fast, to build it fast, and to test it fast, and get feedback back to the developer as quick as possible. Well, if you've got a 45-minute compile time, it breaks that cycle, and developers have a very hard time staying in that design-build-test loop. And so Go focuses on keeping those compile times down, even though it's going to yield us fully compiled binaries at the end. Go is a garbage-collected language, which means that you're not going to have to manage your own memory. Now, you can manage your own memory, but by and large, the Go runtime is going to manage that for you. And the reason for that gets back to the simplicity argument. There is a recognition that a garbage collected language does have challenges when dealing with certain use cases. For example, real-time trading systems for stock market systems have a very hard time when you're dealing with garbage collection. However, the advantages on the developer of not having to manage their own memory all the time were deemed to be more important. Now, that doesn't mean that the delays that a garbage collector incurs haven't been paid attention to. If you go back through the history of the Go language, you'll actually see the past few versions have had a huge emphasis on reducing the amount of time that the application has to pause during a garbage collection cycle. And at this point, they're actually really, really fast, almost to the point that you don't know that a garbage collection happened. In order to address that concern of concurrency, Go does have concurrency primitives built right into the language. And we'll talk about that as we go through some of these videos. But instead of having a library that we're going to have to import in order to work with concurrency, we're going to be able to do concurrent development right there in the base language. Finally, Go compiles down to a standalone library, which means when you compile your Go application, everything is going to be bundled into that single binary that's related to the Go application itself. So the Go runtime is going to be bundled in there. Any libraries that you're depending on, they're going to be compiled in there. So you don't have to worry about reaching out to external libraries and DLLs and things like that in order to make your application work. And what that gives you is version management at runtime becomes trivial because you simply have one binary, you deploy that binary, you run it, and all of its dependencies are there. Now keep in mind, when I say dependencies, I mean the Go dependencies. If you're going to build a web application and that has HTML resources and CSS, those have to be bundled along with the binary, but the binary itself is standalone and self-contained. Okay, the next thing that I'd like to do is show you some of the resources that are available to you as you start to explore the Go language. One of the most useful resources that you're going to be able to take advantage of as you're ramping up on Go is Go's website here at golang.org. Now, why is it golang.org? Well, if you take a minute to think about a language called Go, that doesn't really lend itself to unique search results in Google or Bing. So, golang.org it is. As a matter of fact, a lot of places that you see Go mentioned, you're going to see it actually described as golang because that makes it a little bit more unique when you're looking for search results. So the first thing that you might notice as we go into the home page here is this isn't really laid out like a lot of traditional home pages. This, in my opinion, is very much an engineering home page. So instead of a lot of design aesthetic, this gets right into the engineering aspects and shows you how to start working with the language. So this yellow box over here is going to be your entry point for your first Go application. So if we go ahead and click this Run button, you see that we almost instantly get an application sent back to the server, it gets compiled, and it gets run for us. So we can start playing around with Go code without installing anything on our local machines. And we're actually going to take advantage of that through these first few videos. As a matter of fact, if I make a small change here, so maybe if I say, hello, YouTube peoples, and run that again, then I'm saying hello to you all. So, hi. So it's as simple as that in order to get started with the Go program. 
Beside that window, we see this download go button, and that's going to take you to resources that you're going to be able to use in order to download the latest go binaries, as well as download older versions of the runtime. And if there's an unpublished version, for example, at the time I'm recording this, go 1.8 is at RC2. You can go ahead and download that, install that, and check that for bugs and play around with new features in the language. If we come across to the top, we see this documents link here. And this is going to be another critical resource as you're starting out with the language. As a matter of fact, you're going to refer back to this page quite often. But if you really want to walk through on the website a tour of the Go language, then I would recommend you go to this Getting Started link. This is going to get you started downloading and installing the Go compilers and tools and things like that. And you can see as we navigate there, it's going to show you the different architectures that you're going to be able to use with Go. And there's quite a few and how to get started on each one of those. If we keep continuing down, the tour of Go is kind of an introduction to the Go language that takes you through a gradual introduction. So it's going to start out with some very simple applications and then build up more and more and more and help you understand what's going on with Go concurrency and things like that. Effective Go is a very useful article, especially as you start to mature in your understanding of the language and really understand how the Go language is used. So I would encourage you to go into that. It's a pretty lengthy read, but you should consider this required reading if you're actually going to start building non-trivial Go applications. But we're not going to worry about that right now. We've got plenty of ways to go before we need to get through all of this stuff. And then down here at the bottom is some reference information. This is more advanced documentation that you're probably not going to need right away. But for example, the command documentation gives you a lot of information about the Go tool itself that you're going to use for local development with Go. There's a lot of things that the Go program does, and this is going to help you understand how to navigate that. The packages link is perhaps where I spend the most time on Go's website, and this gives you documentation for all of the libraries that are built into Go. So when you install Go and you install the Go binaries and tools, you're going to get all of these libraries available to you. So just scanning down, you can see that we've got different libraries that are targeted at working with archives. We've got some cryptography libraries, database drivers. Continuing to go down, we've got some things for working with HTML and network traffic. Now some things that you might find missing here are we don't have any GUI libraries. That's because at this point Go really isn't focused on the use case of client application development. So Go is really targeted at building servers and web applications and so that's where a lot of the libraries are going to be focused on. There are some projects that are working on mobile applications using Go as well as client-side applications using Go but they're not officially supported at this point. If we come over to the project link, we're going to find some information about history of the project, what releases have come out and when, as well as some links to mailing lists and resources that you can take advantage of if you want to keep track of the development of Go as a language, as well as if you find an issue in the Go language, you can see some information here on how to report that issue. And then we've got the help link here, and this is going to be one of your more important links as you get started here, because this is going to be your on-ramp into the community. Now the two most active in my experience are the Go Forum, which is a nice discussion forum that allows you to post your questions and get people to answer back. But if you want something a little bit more real time, then the Go for Slack is a Slack channel specifically targeted at Go development. And there's multiple sub channels in there for new developers, for library developers. Even a lot of the Go meetup groups have their own sub channels on the Go for Slack. So if you want to get on the Go for Slack, then I would encourage you to come over here to another website called Golang Bridge. And this is what I consider the on-ramp to the Go community. Because Golang Bridge is specifically there to advocate for the Go language and to make sure that the community is healthy and strong. As I said, one of the key aspects of the Go language is a focus on having an excellent community. And really it's Golang Bridge and the awesome people that support it that are making that happen. So if you scroll down a little bit, you can see some links to the online communities. If you want to join the Slack channel, you do have to receive an invite. So this link here is going to take you to the form that's going to allow you to get that invitation. And there's no problem getting the invitation. The only thing that they ask you is to read the community guidelines. There is a code of conduct that just makes sure that everybody's going to be treated respectfully in the community just to make sure that we're all here trying to help each other out. And the last thing that I want to show you on the website is this play link here. Now this link just flies out an editor and this is really nice because this is available throughout the site. So if I come to the packages and let's just say I dive into the network package and I'm learning about some network function, then I can go ahead and pop into the play. I can create a real quick proof of concept Go application in order to make sure that I understand how that's working. And again, just like we saw on that home page, if I click run, then I can go ahead and execute that. Now there are some limitations. Obviously this application is sent to the back end and there are some limitations. You're not gonna be able to read the file system of the back end, for example. But a lot of the things that you wanna play around with, you can play around with in this online environment. 
Now another place to get at this playground is over here at play.golang.org. And this is the last thing I want to show you in this introductory video. So this is going to be the environment that we're going to focus on. And actually, let me make that a little bit bigger so maybe it's a little easier for you to see. But this is going to be the environment that we're going to focus on as we start to learn the Go language. So we're going to learn the basics of a Go application here. We're going to start playing around with how we're going to work with variables and logic and looping and things like that. Now, eventually, we'll get to installing a local environment. And you can certainly take advantage of the other resources on Golang's website if you want to get there before I create a video on it. But I think that there's a lot that we can talk about without making a commitment to setting up a local development environment by just going through this playground here. So if we take a second look at this application, we see some of the key aspects of any Go program. Now, the first thing that you see at the top is this statement, package main. Every Go application is structured into packages. So every Go file that you're going to have is going to have to declare what package it's a part of. And main is a special package because main is going to be the entry point of any one of your applications. Down below that, we have an import statement. And this is the statement that we're going to use in order to import additional libraries. So this library is called fmpt which, yeah, you actually say that in the Go community. I can't bring myself to say that, so if I call that FMT, I hope that you'll forgive me. But in the Go community, you will also hear this called FMT, and this is the package that's going to allow us to format strings. So you see down below here in our main function, which is the entry point of our application. So the main function in the main package is always going to be our application entry point, and this is going to be where we're going to contain our first code that's going to run in Go. So we're going to call into the FMT library, and we're going to pull out its println function. And that println function takes one argument, and that argument in this case is a string. So we're going to print out hello playground. Now, if I go ahead and run this, then down below at the bottom of the screen here, you see hello playground gets printed out, and then it says program exited. If we have an error in the application, say if I delete this quotation mark and run, then you're going to get a compiler error printed out at the bottom that's going to help you debug your application. So this online environment is going to be very good for you to get started because it's going to help you through understanding what's going on. So for example, we see here in line 8, it got an unexpected semicolon or new line when instead it was expecting a comma or a parenthesis. And the reason for that is because this closing parenthesis actually became part of the string, so the line terminated early and it didn't have an end to the function call. So if we go ahead and re-add the quotation mark and run, we're good to go, and we've got our first start in a Go application. So I hope that this was helpful for you. A little bit of background in a language that you're going to be learning, I always find is a little bit valuable. It helps to understand the motivations for the creation of the language and the major features in order to understand what problems that language is going to try and solve and how it's going to go about trying to solve them. So in the next couple of videos, what I want to do is start digging in on this playground and start learning about how we're going to declare variables, what are the collection types, how to work with creating our own functions and things like that. So I hope you'll stay tuned. Again, if you have any comments, please leave those down below and we'll see you next time.